reading from Matthew 4, verse 12 to 25. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in the Philip, which was by the way of the area of Nephilim, and Nephilim, Nephilim, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, two people living in darkness have been seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, but they were fishing. Come follow me, he said, and I will save you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He was about him spread from all over Syria, and people brought him all who were ill, from various diseases, those suffering from severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and paralyzed, and healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the, the capitals, Jerusalem, Judah, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Thank you. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to you. Please pray with me. Lord God, may the meditations of all of our hearts that are gathered here this morning. And Lord, may the lips and words that come through my lips be truly pleasing in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For those visiting this morning, I just wanted to share with you that we are in the process of working our way through the Gospel of Matthew right now. This is a journey that began back in December, and each Sunday... We are reading verse by verse through the entire gospel <coughs> until we come to its end. And this is really a neat way of, of reading the gospel on Sunday morning because it gives us a fuller context of the story of salvation that's unfolding before us. Now already in the gospel of Matthew, it began with the genealogy of Jesus. And then as you read through the genealogy, there are several people who are outsiders to the kingdom who don't belong. And yet they are grafted in, they are married into the family of God. And it turns out that even Jesus was adopted into the line of David because his father was of the line of David, but his mother was not. Then we read about his miraculous conception and birth through the Virgin Mary. The arrival of the Magi to his side to bring the gifts of gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. They were outsiders. They were unclean, and yet they were welcomed to come to the home of the Lord to worship and praise Him. Then we read about the miraculous escape in the night to Egypt to escape King Herod's soldiers who came to destroy and kill all the baby boys two years and under in Bethlehem. The return then from Egypt a few years later where Jesus grew up in Nazareth in the north of Israel. Then the scripture is quiet. And sometime later, perhaps 20, 25 years later, chapter 3 begins with this wild-haired guy with a big bushy beard wearing camel skins who eats bugs and drinks honey, John the baptizer, and he's saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. John is the last of the great prophets. 
And he is called to be the herald of the Lord. And he has a baptism, a baptism of repentance, which Jesus comes down from Nazareth to, and he submits to this baptism of repentance, fully taking on our identity. And Jesus is already fully God and fully human. But he takes on the sinful nature of humanity through his baptism, and it's a journey that will take him all the way to the cross at Calvary some three years later. Immediately after the baptism, Jesus is driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he is tempted for 40 days in a weakened state by Satan. And yet Jesus is able to resist all of the blows that Satan was throwing at him. He was able to remain pure and clean while our first father, Adam, was not. He had given into temptation. Okay. That was the 90-second catch-up. <laughs> and now we're ready for today's reading. We read that at the very beginning of the reading this morning that, that Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. So John, you know, that's John the Baptizer, his cousin. And he's been preaching and teaching down in Judea. And apparently after Jesus has been baptized, after he's been tempted in the wilderness, Jesus has kind of withdrawn. And we don't know exactly what's happening, but his public ministry has not inaugurated itself yet. But once John is arrested, when he's put into prison, and we'll hear more about John later in the Gospel of Matthew, what his future looks like, that's when Jesus inaugurates his public ministry. And one would think that if you were the coming king, if you were the Messiah, if you were the promised one of the people of Israel, the one an entire people group has been waiting for, yearning for, for 2,000 years, that you would begin your ministry in a place of influence, a place where something could be done, where things happen, that you'd be in Jerusalem, the big city, the place where the university was, the temple was, a place of learning and scholarship, a place where the business bigwigs were, where the political insiders were. That's where Jesus should be to begin his ministry. But that's not where he's at. Jesus withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum, which was a, a community, a fishing community on, on the Sea of Galilee. And it's interesting that almost everything we know about Galilee in the first century is bad. We know, first of all, that Naphtali and Zebulon, two of the tribes of Israel, which are mentioned in the Isaiah reading, which was fitted, uh, that's not a word, is it? Which was placed <laughs> into here by, by Matthew. That Zebulon in the land of Naphtali is Galilee of the Gentiles. And as you read through the Old Testament, those two particular tribes had some issues. They went through some turmoil, uh, some trials. They weren't always the most cooperative with the other uh, ten tribes of Israel. And it's interesting that in the year 722 B.C., here comes the history lesson every week. You're going to get one. But in the year 722 B.C., when the Assyrian armies came and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, they took a large percentage of the population of that northern kingdom, and they removed it. The people just disappeared over the course of time. And they moved in, Gentile people, outsiders, pagans, into these lands. And we know from Josephus, who was a, a contemporary, a rough contemporary of Jesus, he wrote uh, historical books. And one time he was the governor of Galilee. He said it was a land full of troublemakers. It was half pagan, half zealot. And half Jew. <laughs> I'll tell you, don't be embarrassed saying all those things. That doesn't add up. But it was a troubled place. It was a land that was looked down on. And if you recall in the Gospel of John, in the very first chap chapter, when Philip goes to Nathaniel and he says, Hey, we have found the one, the promised one in the scriptures, the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, Oh, where did you find him? Nazareth? And the response, can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, Galilee is not a well-followed community. 
And yet that is exactly where Jesus begins, where he inaugurates his public work. When you think of inauguration, I usually think of speeches, inaugurals. And three different times, from my own experience, popped to my mind. Uh, when I was in the military, I was in the Army for three years, whenever there was a command change, whether it be at the company level, the battalion level, or the brigade level, we were always assembled together. Those of you who are veterans, you understand this. You had to have your shoes shine, your buckles brassoed. You had to look nice and pretty, and you had to stand still at attention for the longest time while that captain, lieutenant colonel, or full bird went on and on and on about how he was going to improve morale. How uh, he was going to do this great thing and that great thing. It was a time of empowerment and appreciation. That was his inauguration. Another kind that I've experienced is when I worked for Walmart in store management for a number of years, when a new chief executive officer would come into the company, all the management, we had to go back to the, to the management room and through closed circuit television, we had to watch the speech of the new chief executive officer. How this guy was going to improve the morale of the stores. He was going to improve efficiency and do that. He's going to bring all the different peoples together and it was going to be a happier place where we held hands and sang kumbaya. <laughs> then there's the third type of inauguration that, that that we can appreciate that is when we have a new president of the United States. And it doesn't matter if this is a Democrat or Republican. You know, every four years, you know, we elect a president, and they have their inaugural address. And every president since the history of the beginning of this country has had basically a divided country. And typically in the inaugural address, it's a time of soaring vision, of lifting high the common good, trying to find things that unite the people and don't divide them. And oftentimes when you're watching, unless you're just really, really cold in here, even if it's a person you didn't vote for, you may just think, you know, this guy ain't so bad. At least you think that for a little while. <laughs> but the inaugural time is a time of uplifting speeches, a time of compassion to bring people together. And Jesus steps forward at his inauguration, a time when he can use lofty words, soaring rhetoric. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, that's not what the people were looking to hear. That's the very same thing that John the Baptizer was saying down in Judea when he was baptizing in the Jordan River. Repent. Well, what does it mean to repent? It doesn't just mean that we come forward and say, you know, God, I confess that what I was doing was wrong. Help me to be a better person. That's not repentance. Repentance is when you fundamentally change course. When you are going this direction and you're going the wrong way and you realize that God convicts it upon your heart that you're going the wrong way and you plead with the Lord, you say, Lord, forgive me for what I am doing. Help me change what I am and you no longer go this way, but you go this way. You turn away from the sinful way in which you are living. There's a, a question I have for you this morning. And you don't have to raise your hands. Are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we're sinners? Let me ask you again. Are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we're sinners? This is basically what Jesus is putting out there to the people. We read in the Gospels and we read throughout the Old Testament and in the epistles that every single person on the earth is guilty of being a sinner. And people don't like to hear this is not the happy book. The 
the message of Scripture, the witness of the Word of God, is that the reason we sin is because we are fundamentally sinful people. And Jesus wants us to repent, to turn away from that nature, to take on a new nature. Take on His nature. Our first pair, our <coughs> things didn't always used to be that way. If you recall in the early chapters of Genesis, at the very end of the creative process, the Lord God looked at all that he had created, and it was good. Oh, train. Awesome. It wasn't just good. The first days, everything was good. But when creation was complete, and God looked at all that he created, it was very good. It's a double positive. That means it was super duper perfect good. <laughs> And God had this implied covenant with Adam and with Eve that you will care for creation. You will be the stewards. You will do the work of caring. And in return, I will be your God. I will meet your needs. I will provide everything that you could ever possibly do. The only thing I ask is you don't eat from this particular tree. Adam and Eve could not live within that covenant. In a we know the story, right? They ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from, and they were removed from the garden. But the interesting thing that happened, as they were being removed from the garden, God made a promise. God made a promise. He said, Eve, from you, I'm paraphrasing, from you a child will come, and that child will crush the head of the serpent the one who tempted you to do these things. Adam and Eve rejected the covenant of God and ushered sin into the world. And we are born into a sinful world, into a broken world. And we have embraced that sinful world. And you're out there thinking, I have not embraced anything. Yes, you have. <laughs> But God rejects our rejection. God says, you may have said no to me, but I don't accept that no. I reject your rejection. Indeed, the one who is coming from Eve is the one who will make right the broken relationship that we have and will return everything back to its original perfect state. And Jesus coming into the world, the Son of God, who is fully man and fully God. He is the one in this first time, his inaugural into the world, he is the one who will make right the broken relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. But the world is still broken. Jesus ascended to heaven almost 2,000 years ago. And yet, I sometimes have a hard time looking around me and really seeing evidence of the kingdom of heaven. But it's coming. It's a work in process. And in fact, after Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, he goes and he hits the road and he says, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, follow me. You're fishermen, but I'll teach you how to fish for people. See, God uses humans, fallen, broken, sinful people, to work through, to usher in the kingdom promise. Jesus had his intimate group of 12. And by the way, this is a fascinating thing because Jesus did something very bad when he called those men to be his followers. Good rabbis, good teachers didn't recruit people to follow them. People who wanted to learn went to the rabbi and asked, can I follow you? Can I live with you? Can I learn from you? Will you allow me that privilege? But Jesus forsook that. He went to the people. And he called them to himself. And people responded. Jesus is calling us today in much the same way he called Peter, James, Andrew, and John. He wants us to be his agents. The Holy Spirit works through us in sharing the gospel message of life. 
that a day is coming. Let it be today, Lord Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. When there will be no more hunger, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more hurt, where there will be no more desperation, where there will be no more death, when there will be no more mourning, when there will be no more persecution, when there will be no more emptiness and depression and sickness. That day is coming. And the Lord Jesus is counting on us to proclaim that day, to be his heralds as a response to the grace that we've been given. The word evangelical has really gotten a bad name in the last several years because there's some knuckleheads out there. I don't think I've ever used that word in the sermon before. <laughs> there, are some, there are some knuckleheads out there who say some pretty outrageous things who call themselves evangelicals. But brothers and sisters, <clears throat> evangelical is a beautiful thing. It's one who is in love with the good news of Jesus. There are people who recognize they have been saved by grace as a gift from God and not by anything they can do on their own. And they are in love with Jesus. They appreciate the work of the Holy Spirit and they respect the Word of God because that's what reveals everything about God to them. And they want to share that in a beautiful way, in a loving way, not like a sledgehammer being knocked against your head. Not of love. Out of care. Because the day of judgment is coming. And it'll be both a great day and a terrible day. And we want the world to know how beautiful the Lord Jesus really is. He called those first four. He's called millions since. And he calls us now. Let's respond to this.